reason we're teaching seven habits, the reason why you all are teaching seven habits, because we believe this about work. Excellent work. I gotta do what I'm doing well. I can't do it shoddy. I can't do SEO poorly, can I? Can't sell real estate poorly, even if it's farmland. None of it. I can't, I can't not be good at what I'm doing no matter what I'm, I'm doing. I've been given some menial task. I gotta do it well because I really don't have a right to talk to anybody if I'm not doing what I'm doing well. And so when I do excellent work, I can bless others and I can actually be so confident I'm good at it that I can start turning my eyes to them a little bit and seeing, is it helping them? I can start to, and then if I'm helping them enough, who's had somebody basically say to them, maybe not with this quote, but I know you've all had it, why do you care about me more than yourself in this deal? Just in the way we're working today. I know somebody said that about Taylor before. You're helping me do your work. I know you're getting behind on yours. Oh. Why is that? Oh. They, just, they just invited her to, te to tell them about Jesus, didn't, didn't they? When they say that. Okay. Habits are like this. When you have the desire to do something. We have, a, we have an awesome Easter service. He went to an incredible Easter service and knows Jesus better. Okay. So he gives us desire to know him better, to know the knowledge, to do things better, and then to pick up some skills. And, and Covey says in the intro of this book that one of these areas can make you move toward the other. The Venn diagram can close. Because I have a new desire, I'll go pick up the skill, I'll go pick up knowledge. Or, because, or I realize all of a sudden I have this skill, and I have the knowledge to go, now I need the knowledge to use it better, and the desire to, to, to use it for others. So that's the way the habits work. And then one, one last descriptor before we get the winning team up here um, is this. He says the progression, we're teaching this so you can grow professionally and spiritually simultaneously. That's what Harry Smith said. But we have a dependence and, and, and then we move to be, being fully independent. Now we know in Christ, we're be, we disagree with Covey slightly on this because he, he, he's, not, not, he's not saying this isn't true. He just doesn't make it perfectly clear that it is true. We are completely dependent. You've been chosen. You've been appointed. You, you're God, you, your, your very breath is sustained by Christ. Okay, so we are dependent, but these habits, so then look at these. We've called them in practice. You have agency. You have choices. Today, he's giving you those. You have free will. You have agency. So begin with the end in mind and put what matters first, first. And then that moves you to be ready to be interdependent, to more working with others and blessing people. And they're about to tell us what that means. All right, Will and Tom. So I actually, well, I used to work at Wonderman, actually, when Howard was there and, and uh, with Taylor as well. And then in 2020, started a company. We do um, outsource bookkeeping and payroll for small to mid-sized businesses. And uh, now I've grown from a team, uh, a team from one to now three. And that's what I do every day. Uh, yeah, I work for Deloitte, a professional services firm. I started in their auto practice. Um, quickly found out that was not uh, the right fit for uh, my goals. And uh, now I work in their government consulting practice. We do basically technology implementation for the government um, and get to work on local clients and state clients here in Tennessee and Memphis, uh, which has uh, definitely fit my, my personal goals um, better. Uh, but Will gave us a great intro. Uh, today we're talking about uh, this chapter on win-win, and it was uh, a bit of a further stretch than some of uh, the, the previous ones to get to a traditional um, devotional Bible study. Uh, it was very heavy on our, uh, on our work life, which is great, and uh, gave a wealth of examples for, for Will and I today. Uh, but uh, how we want to set this up is we want to tell you about the win-lose paradigms that Covey explains in this book. Uh, then we want to give you a couple qualifications for how you can apply it in your life. And then finally, uh, once we've given you those two, uh, we want to talk through the, what the characteristics are of someone uh, who can create win-wins uh, in their life. So without further ado, uh, when we look up at this, uh, this matrix here, uh, we have 
what Covey explains to be five. There are four boxes here, uh, but uh, we want to just walk through quickly what each of these would represent in your day-to-day -day life. Um, uh, the win-win, of course, is something we'll talk about more today, so I won't cover it, but uh, suffice it to say, it's all about mutual benefit. It's all about uh, an interdependent reality that we understand so that we can um, go forth and uh, respect people on the other side of the table. Um, but uh, as we open here, we do want to cover what these others look like in day-to-day -day life. So win-lose is traditionally how uh, a, a businessman, a businesswoman uh, will go into life. They will think of everything as competition, uh, not cooperation. This has been dug into us uh, in our lives through school, through sports, through approval of parents, and it's driven by the dichotomies that we see uh, and how we, how we picture our life. So um, it, it's our win-lose dichotomy. It's uh, in Memphis the black-white dichotomy. Um, in town or in the suburbs, uh, IPC or Redeemer. Uh, you know, we, uh, we have dichotomies uh, how, we, how we view our life. Um, so, so the win-lose is how many businessmen uh, and businesswomen uh, will go throughout uh, a, in, in a competitive manner rather than a cooperative one. Uh, but moving on, we also have a lose-win. So this is more people-pleasing. Uh, in the book, Covey explains that managers typically will um, flip back and forth from win-lose to lose-win. They want to get what they want done, but they also would like to give a win to other people uh, at their expense, maybe doing something else for them that's their job, uh, as long as they end up in, in a win situation. Um, and, and this kind of comes into our uh, relational context as uh, something of a, of a more downtrodden attitude, like they've stepped on me, they've always stepped on me, and they're going to step on me again. Um, and I think all of us uh, have known someone like that in our life, uh, and, and that, is, that is the opposite here that we see of the win-lose. Uh, and then uh, moving on to a couple of more rare items, the, the lose-lose that Covey explains. He gives this great story. Story. It's a divorce story. It's the lose lose is you're like, I'm not getting mine, and if I don't get mine, he's not getting his, uh, and we're both going to go down with the ship. He tells this story uh, about uh, someone he knew that uh, went through a divorce, and the uh, the court set up a um, a settlement where the the wife would get uh, fifty percent. They they split everything fifty fifty, but the husband was in charge of of selling the things, and so this wife started getting these checks for like. $50, $25 with like the titles like jewelry, BMW. And, and she went to her lawyer, she was like, hey, like what's happening? Like these are worth far more. Uh, what it turned out, the, uh, the, the ex-husband had been selling uh, these things for per, uh, percentages, for cents on the dollar, just so that his ex-wife would not get any money. Um, the the lose-lose personified there. And then lastly, the win. Uh, so that's the final paradigm. So we've got win-win, win-loss, loss win loss loss and finally just win um this is i'm gonna get mine and i hope you get yours i'm not gonna be the guy to help you but um i, I immediately thought of the dmv it's like you go in there and you're just locked in you're like i've got my number this is my number i will get what i what i need to get uh, and then I'm getting out of here and, you know, best of luck to everybody else. Um, so uh, those are the paradigms we set up. Uh, and, and what Covey explains as he walks through this is that uh, really if you understand Christ's message as well as um, have a, a mutual respect for the, the person on the other side of the table, uh, the win-win no deal, as he explains it, which uh, the no deal portion is that you can... Uh, Agree. It basically, if you don't find a win-win, you both agree to walk away. Agree. Yeah. Uh, uh, disagree agreeably there you is go. what That's Covey said. Um, it is really the only way. But uh, seeing that in a reality uh, was tough for me, and so we wanted to present to y'all a couple of qualifications for um, how you can you can understand the win-win, how it applies to your life. If you look at this paradigm, obviously you have. In, in any sort of win slash lose, any combination, you're at the center. And it's also very short-sighted. Um, Win-win takes those and flips it on its head. Um, and ultimately, it's a total philosophy of 
human interaction, which is why we wanted to qualify what we're about to talk about. Where, does, where do win-wins happen? Because it's really easy if you're reading through the chapter to only see like in a business context. Uh, and we wanted to say like, this is not just confined to the workplace. So this, this, like he said, is a total philosophy of human interaction. This can be just in your day-to-day -day relationships. Doesn't, you don't have to be in charge of a huge company who's making deals and have things be very quantitative and easily measured. This, can, this is very interpersonal, interdependent. And so we wanted to make sure and highlight that of where win-wins happen. And then finally, how do they happen? And honestly, this is where, where do we get the power uh, for win-wins and to seek them? And that's where we wanted to talk through um, this verse. So 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. As believers, we we believe that we do have everything that we need. Um, and so if, if everything material was stripped away, we have the, the most valuable thing. We have the pearl in the field that's worth selling everything to go and get. And so when we actually can, when we have the power through Christ, through all that he's done for us, uh, to actually outwardly seek the good of others, we can then approach relationships, uh, work, in a real mutual beneficial way where you're concerned more about the other person than yourself and that and also too you don't want to fall in i know for me at least lose win uh is a paradigm that i kind of struggle with because there's a certain like people pleasing to it where you feel like uh if you're losing it's it's christ-like and uh the other person is automatic you have to lose in order for them to win and covey says that's not the case and i don't think christ would say that's the case either it's a mutual thing uh where you're both coming together and and seeking what's best for both or no deal you walk away and so those are the two kind of qualifications we wanted mm. to present before we get into uh the five dimensions of what this looks like and how to do it yeah and, and i'll just add one more thing in there um our qualification of where it occurs uh if you read this chapter <laughs> it, it's um it's interesting as someone in in my position uh, of of life and career work, um, Covey's stories center around these high powered business negotiations where he comes in for these massive companies and sees these huge changes that he makes. Um, and I read it and and I look at it, I'm like, I got my first team member who reports to me like two months ago <laughs> in my career like i i uh i work for a firm with four hundred thousand employees a hundred thousand of those maybe are in consulting half of those uh in government and so uh my understanding of what a win-win could be um is not like i'm changing some um some large portion of the system or even negotiating with our clients for you know simple uh, additions to our work um, um, and, and so the key for me in this qualification was the interdependent reality, uh, which uh, is the key to understanding the win. Um, and uh, when you see the interdependent reality, meaning that, that every decision I make is not a solo decision. Uh, the decisions and transactions I have in my in my day to day life uh, with my coworkers, with my, my analysts that I got three months ago or with my boss or just in Memphis around those are impacted and, and each of us leaves that situation uh, with a feeling uh, of, of either um, lose win, win win. Uh, it, the paradigms interact uh, with a, each of our interactions and um, what Will shared with us that verse allows me as a consultant level which is like analyst consultant level in Deloitte are, are the first two levels. You're, you're just getting in there. Um, and, and so it allows me to embrace the win-win uh, and, uh, and understand that my behavior can change with this paradigm and impact people rather than just the managers, the coveys of the world. Yeah, so we get into, okay, the five dimensions of how win-wins actually happen in real life and it starts with character as you can see it flows through to relationships and then we get to agreements support systems and processes to uh, provide definition to what it looks like day to day and so we'll start with what character looks like we move from mm. there yeah so uh 
character, uh, integrity, maturity, and abundance mentality is how Covey uh, describes it. Uh, and Will and I, when we were talking through this, we were like, okay, like character, like we get it, like you got to be a good guy. But uh, <laughs> when we were thinking through it, this chapter boils down to, you know, can you define what is a win for yourself? Um, like, do you know, do you have the integrity to, um, to set a goal for yourself, agree to that goal, uh, and not waver? Uh, and, and that is, is really the key of integrity and maturity is, do you know what you want to win if you could win? Um, but, but the second point uh, along with character comes at the abundance mentality, which we've mentioned a couple times, uh, but it may be easier for you to understand uh, by flipping it on its head and talking, what, what's the opposite of an abundance mentality? Uh, Covey explains, it's called scarcity mentality. So um, when I was in 10th grade at MUS, uh, I had a scarcity mentality on the football field. Um, my brother was a senior, and we played the same position. We played, uh, we played wide receiver. And so the scarcity mentality I had was every snap and every good thing that Sam does, um, that's worse for me. <laughs> I would like Sam to not do well. Um, there are limited snaps, there are limit, limited times on Friday night I could be seen out there in that field. Um, and every time he does something good, uh, it hurts me. That's a scarcity mentality. Um, and, and the opposite of that would have been uh, more similar to our relationship now, where uh, we, we're discussing our wins, our trials, our tribulations in a way that although we, we work in the same field, we both can succeed. There is enough out there for us to both succeed and both have mutual benefit. Mm -hmm. I, I would venture to say that win-wins actually, it completely hinges on whether you have an abundance mentality or not. Because what that implies is an abundance mentality means there's plenty for everybody. And if there's plenty for everybody, it means it's possible to find a win for somebody else. If there's not, which honestly, I mean, I would... I think it's fair to say that there are very specific circumstances, let's call it like professional sports or something like that, where someone does have to lose. So there is a scarcity built into to it, but in, I would say, 99% of our interactions, there, if we believe, too, again, that Christ is at the center of all that he's done for us, then there is plenty. Uh, and his, uh, it's, it's, it's a well that doesn't run dry. And so I think that, to me, is, is the most important in, a, in an example that... I was thinking about that um, in my life is how I uh, don't believe in this abundance mentality when you look at my actions versus, you know, here what we're talking about from a conceptual standpoint is, you know, owning, owning my own business, it's really, really easy for me to uh, do nothing but work. And at night, and it's, it's really tough sometimes for me to log off. At a reasonable hour and by the way we'll get to this in just a second but my wife my wife now works with me full time um, and so now it's even easier to for both of us we know that what's going on in each other's work lives where I, she knows what's on our plate and so it's really now easy almost easier for me to say okay I'm just going to work a little bit later tonight but what does that what does that say what does that behavior say it says that if I don't get this done, then something worse might happen, and then we'll lose the business, and then we'll, you know, it's all this scarcity, where it's like, we're, we're gonna lose this thing that we've built. Um, not realizing that logging off at a reasonable hour might, in fact, be the biggest win-win for not only her and I, obviously, but then my clients too. I come in the next day, I'm, I'm fresher. I'm, I'm actually, I have a really, um, a better perspective and a more balanced mentality in that sense sense so it's it's funny how that scarcity mentality really does i feel like it's deeply rooted in us and we have to to fight almost to re remind ourselves that no we're, we're living in an abundance reality so mm. um so moving from character it flows into you know the interdependence has relationships at their core and so when we talk about relationships this is a good summary we care about the other enough to genuinely want a win-win or we walk away if it's not reached and i'll give a couple examples both from this standpoint and also the next one which is the agreement so how do you actually give definition and direction to the win-win once you've both decided that you want it and so um 
So as I mentioned, my wife and I, we worked together full time. It wasn't always like that. She uh, worked at KPMG. Um, in the back of my mind, I'd always known that, you know, I'd, I'd love for her to come and work one day. And we thought it was going to be far away. Um, and so along as we started conversations about, okay, what would this actually look like? Um, you know, one thing that I think is important when you're looking for a win-win is timing. Um, we had the agreement that until it is a win-win, it's going to be a no deal. And it's, it's you know, obviously you're, there's some level of risk um, when she walks away from, you know, our insurance was with her company. You know, what happens with that when it gets taken away? What do we do? Um, obviously, if she comes and joins and things crash and burn, like we both are now looking for something. So there's a level of risk baked in. And uh, so there had to be some level of, of support there. But then at the end of the day, I also, um, when it got to the point where we were having real conversations about it, uh, I was drowning. Like I really needed somebody. And I also had never been a boss before. And so it was almost like this, this ultimate win-win that happened where you know she had the qualifications, she was ready to go, and the timing was right. And I could almost like, you know, I guess have her as a guinea pig of what it would look like to have an employee. <laughs> and she was going to be honest about my performance in that area, no matter what. And so it was like this, I don't know, it's just like ultimate win-win when I look back and see it. And you know, obviously there's been like really, uh, she sees the toughest days and the best days at the same time. And so like, I would not want it anything different, honestly, about our situation. Um, but we had to be honest with ourselves about where we were along the way or else I was gonna try to get her to jump in way too soon. Um, and so there's that. And then also when I think about, um, you know, as relationships, if you want a win-win for each other and you move into the agreement phase, one of the things that I always wanted to think about as I was setting up my company, because basically what it looks like for us is if, if you're a small business that's wanting to potentially outsource your bookkeeping and payroll. Um, Come to us. <laughs> yeah, business cards on the table. No. Um, no, I wanted to think about, okay, you know, it's a big commitment. I mean, you're bringing somebody into, um, some would say like the most vulnerable part of, of your business, which is your finances. And, um, you know, there's a level of vulnerability in admitting that either you feel like you, you can't do it yourself anymore as a business owner or, um, or you want somebody that's going to, you know, shepherd it well. And so um, I wanted there to be a, um, you know, it obviously starts with the relationship and, and that's the core of it. But how do we set this up to where it really is a win for everybody? And so one of the things we decided really early on is we are only going to be doing month to month contracts. And that gives everybody the opportunity to opt out if you ever feel like you know, there's a different direction that needs to be taken. And so that was baked in. We also then also uh, baked in every six months, we both have a big meeting and we sit down and we look at the agreement that we've put in place. Have we met what we've agreed with each other will be the deliverables? Um, is the scope correct? Are we, um, you know, being overworked or Honestly, are we? Is it taking less time than we estimated? If so, we we move that around. And so there's these, um, you know, checkpoints baked into where you're not getting locked into something that you immediately regret. And if it ever becomes a situation where it's it's a win lose or a lose win, we have we have those guardrails baked in. And so um, that was one thing I wanted to mention. Let's see. You want to talk about the structure? Yes. Yeah, so the the fourth aspect of uh, the five dimensions, or I, I'll say the fourth dimension, um, is is structure and system. Um, and again, uh, these are the dimensions of the win win. This is how it happens. Um, and, and structure and system here, as Covey describes, is to align incentives to our desired outcomes. Um, he tells a great story um, about, about these, these managers. This, this management team pulls them in, pulls Covey's team in. It's like, hey, my managers are doing great, but my staff are doing horribly. Uh, and, and we think it's the staff's problem. Develop an HR solution for us to make these people better. Um, and Covey goes in, uh, and, and what he finds is that uh, the manager's uh, pay was based upon how much they sold. 
And the managers also had the power to uh, determine when they would be selling. And so uh, the managers uh, in this company would, would put the staff on, uh, on stock duty, on shelf duty, during the peak times and would rake in all the sales um, while the staff would be put on the lower end, lower traffic time. Uh, and, and, and Covey goes back to, to this um, head director and is like, hey man, uh, the people are not the problem, the structure is the problem. Um, but when you deal with the structures and systems that you uh, interact with in, uh, in your employee, in your day-to-day, -day, both uh, at work and, and in Memphis, where we see structures and systems um, all the time that we're quick to call it as bad, um, uh, we need the Lord's help uh, through the, the verse that we read to identify ways to positively interact with, with both the population in Memphis uh, and the people that we, we are in, our bosses um, who can affect our pay and the people below us whose pay we can affect. Um, and, and to uh, have a successful win-win, we must align the incentives correctly to our desired outcomes that we have. Yeah, and even taking it a step further in the chapter, he talks about how if you can be very clear about um, what the desired result is and how you're going to get there and also how you're going to evaluate where you are then all of a sudden you give whoever's working on the project the clarity and freedom to self-regulate and they know how they're doing every possible turn it doesn't depend on a manager who's who's you know sending the performance reviews and so that's the ultimate goal is for alignment and mutual benefit hmm. and the fi the final dimension has to do with process I would say flow very nicely into what's going to be discussed in the next couple of weeks so we're gonna we're gonna leave it there I would say um, that just in summary the way that we we look at win-win and, and then all the different paradigms it's really again easy to um, to be short-sighted and put us at the center in everything that we're doing. And what Covey argues, and what I agree with after going through this chapter, is that ultimately um, you will lose unless you're looking for a win-win. Because in the long run, you think about the win-lose, obviously whoever you've, whoever lost in the deal is going to be frustrated, and that relationship isn't going to last once they realize what's happened. In a lose-win, you're gonna bury your own resentment, and ultimately that's not gonna end well either um, and then in the other outcomes you you are at the middle of it all and we know that when we're in the middle things things don't always work out in the long run and so it's almost putting Christ in the center allows for us to be reminded of the abundance mentality that then leads to where we can focus on mutual benefit in our day-to-day -day relationships and you know at work as well um, and then time what's the time horizon what time horizon Will's right it looks like lose we lose win for a minute but what's the time horizon what's your time horizon how long are you gonna live forever. he's gonna live forever oh, yeah. of <laughs> okay what's the math I know he's proclaimed Jesus well I know that he was chosen before the beginning of the world to live forever and how does that affect the lose win <gasps> yeah and your, and your job your spouse Hold her up holy and blameless. That's the, that's, and, and why can't we do that for everybody? Why can't we walk away for everybody? So look, I want you to see the character of God in this, okay? Consideration and courage are the key points. Consideration is how much do I care? Your wife greatly. You, you, we got to make sure she sees that video. You did a great job say, saying that. Like, can, my consideration is ultimate for my, for my spouse. And lo... And my courage is great. But a couple of times we maybe even phrase Jesus as going, was his, was his a win-win? Or was it a lose-win? What was it? Win -win. Win -win. Why? For the joy set before him, he, he endured the cross. He endured the shame. He endured it all. And now I just want to, if I still have three minutes, the, let's look at the prodigal God right here. There's probably no parable that understand that helps you understand the character of God and win-win better than this. The son comes. He wants all the money. Uh, he did. By the way, he's the second son. There's all sorts of stuff going on here, and it means I wish he was dead. You know, I wish Dad was dead. I want my stuff. I want to go. I want the money. Dad is now a thing. 
Okay, so that's what we do when we, we think about nickels. And what does the, what's the prodigal God do? God is, God is the person here representing in the Father. What does he do? Take it. Was that high consideration or low consideration for a son? Huh. He gave him half his stuff. He knew, Joel, didn't he know that that wasn't going to work out? He knew perfectly, just like you. You know about your son. That ain't going to work. I mean, I hope it works, actually. But I don't think that's going to work. Highest consideration. He gave him half a thing. Was it high courage or low courage? Highest courage. I only need half my stuff. He can have it. Highest consideration. Highest courage. And really kind of deal, no deal. We don't have a deal. So you just take it. It's really a deal, no deal, right? Take it. And how do we know? Because he, see, God loves you so much that he says, take it. See if that will satisfy you. See if those nickels will satisfy you. See if not treating each person the way you want to be treated, see if that will satisfy you. See if you maximize this deal for yourself. See if that's going to satisfy you. Go ahead, try. He says, Romans 12, 2, test it and you'll see. It's not going to satisfy you. It might for 20 years, but you'll be back. And then what does, our, what does the gracious father do when the kid son ends up in pig slop? He's laying around that pig slop and he says, man, it'd be better to be a servant in my father's house than it would be to be here in this pig slop. And he plans an apology. This is a great, my favorite part about that parable is he plans the apology out. And he gets, when he starts walking up the road, what's that, where's the dad? Where's the father? He's where? Ladder? He's waiting. He knows how it's going to turn out. He's waiting. He's looking for him, coming up the road. And he starts his apology. Go, go look at it later today, this weekend, Sunday morning. What go look at it. He doesn't even get to start his apology. He's re-robed, re-ringed. Sandals on his feet. Fatted calf killed. Restored totally as a son. Gets half the stuff again. That's good math, isn't it? I take half of it, all of it, waste it, I get half again. Totally restored. It just, it, it's infinite. The timeline is infinite. The cash is infinite. Anything, you, it's infinite. 